Thank you very much for your kind invitation, Professor Dill. Uh, it's my greatest pleasure to be joining this ceremony as a delegate. So I'm going to present the, uh, yeah, of course, AI issue uh, in the endoscopy field. Can you see my slide? Yes. So the uh, previous discussion was really interesting, uh, which includes the intra-evaluated variance and also the coverage of the insurance for the optical diagnosis. I think AI will play a really important role to overcome these two issues. Uh, this is my COIs. So let me just introduce the explosion of the AI medicine research uh, if you look at the American market, uh, over 25 AI devices have already cleared the regulatory approval uh, uh, in the United States uh, in the last five years. But uh, uh, what about uh, endoscopy practice? I guess the uh, most uh, representative form of AI in uh, in the endoscopy field, maybe uh, main focus is on colonoscopy like this. However, if you look at only colonoscopy related devices have cleared the regulatory approval in the field of AI. And unfortunately, there is no AI tools uh, approved in the field of apogee endoscopy, EUS or ERCP. Uh, this is partly because of the uh, lack of data in these categories and also the uh, main focus in the West is on colonoscopy. That would be the one reason. So today I'm gonna focus on colonoscopy based on the uh, market uh, perspective. And why AI is required in the colonoscopy field? This is apparently because of the uh, uh, imperfectness of the uh, endoscopy in lower GI. If you look at the polyp missing rate, it's around 20% or 30% during retrieval of endoscope. And if you find a polyp, there is gonna be a chance of misdiagnosis of the prediction of histopathology of the polyps. And a large scale population-based trial uh, demonstrated that the optical diagnosis the accuracy is limited to 87% sensitivity with a 65 specificity, which is not perfect. So to cover these drawbacks, uh, uh, we are trying to apply AI technologies into colonoscopy practice. And this technology is roughly divided into two categories. Uh, one is the detection, the other one is the optical diagnosis. And I'd like to talk about uh, uh, detection first, followed by the CDX or characterization issue. And uh, this is the uh, uh, device provided by Olympus Corporation. And here you can find the automatic detection of the depressed area of the coronoscopy images. And actually this lesion was proved to be corrected cancer embedding to the submucosal layer. So I guess this kind of technology is useful not only for adenoma detection, but also for cancer recognition. And this project, project, product is called Endobrain Eye, which is fortunately on the market uh, in India as well as in Japan. And if you look at the West, uh, the product called GeoGenius is the first that have cleared the regulatory approval in the Europe. Uh, this is amazing because uh, you can find a tiny lesion like this uh, with the help of AI, which is otherwise overlooked by non-experts. And if you look at the evidence of computer edit detection, uh, it's amazing because the, uh, this RCT conducted in China uh, demonstrated that 9% absolute increment in terms of ADR uh, with use of AI, which is decent value, I guess. And uh, we have recently summarized the data of the, uh, of the last uh, uh, of the RCTs conducted uh, during the last two years. And according to this meta-analysis, ADR was expected to increase from 20% to 30%, uh, which is a really big value uh, if you look at the effect of ADR on cancer prevention. 
As you can see in this slide, uh, less cancer death is expected with the higher ADR. So how to increase higher ADR or achieve higher ADR is a really big topic in colonoscopy field. And in this regard, AI will play a really important role. Perhaps it may be uh, affecting the cancer prevention effect. So uh, in line with this kind of evidence, the society is moving forward. Uh, this is the latest guideline published in ASG. And according to this guideline, with use, a use of AI during colonoscopy is weekly recommended based on the weak evidence. Uh, although it's a weak recommendation, uh, I think uh, it's a really encouraging for us as a, a practitioner or a researcher uh, because it's a first a guideline which endorses the use of AI in clinical practice. Uh, let me move on to the next topic, uh, namely computer edit prediction of histopathology of polyps. And uh, uh, here, uh, the main target is basically a small lesion because of its prevalence. Uh, I, I guess the uh, polyps less than 10 millimeter accounts for 80% of all polyps during colonoscopy. And uh, uh, it, it's very challenging to identify neoplastic change from non-neoplastic polyps uh, uh, from the images uh, taken in a white light image. So in this picture, you can find eight polyps. However, four are neoplastic, while the remaining are non-neoplastic. It's, I guess it's very challenging. Uh, actually, the, uh, the left four are adenomas, while the remaining fours uh, are non-neoplastic non polyp, including the uh, inflammatory polyp and uh, hyperplastic polyp. So how to overcome this challenge? I think there is some room for improvement with use of AI. Now, uh, this is the product developed in Canada. And with the use of this device, uh, you can predict the histology of adenomas in a real-time fashion. Uh, however, this device is not on the market due to the lack of the regulatory approval. But uh, we've got a really a nice device which is on the market in Japan and as a, in other, other Asian countries, uh, which is called EndBrain. And the brain uh, allows a real-time recognition of histopathology with use of AI. As you can see, this polyp is identified as non-neoplastic polyp uh, with the aid of AI. And this technology is closely combined uh, with the endocytoscopy, which uh, Professor Sano previously presented. And uh, with the use of the data from the uh, endocytoscopy, uh, you can get an immediate prediction of histopathology uh, in this regard. But if you look at the uh, evidence in the field of computer-aided diagnosis for polyp recognition, it's mm -hmm. less attractive than that for a computer-aided detection, where you can find a six or a seven RCTs. Here, you can find just uh, uh, six prospective studies and unfortunately, there was no multicenter studies, no RCTs, uh, all the studies, but one included less than 100 patients. So the evidence level was really low. Uh, therefore, I think we should wait for a couple of years to get a high confidence on the use of computer edit diagnosis in clinical practice. Now uh, here I'd like to present uh, one paper of uh, which is the largest scale R, uh, trial in this field. Uh, actually, we have conducted this study. Uh, uh, in this study, we have included around uh, 700 patients who had a uh, uh, real-time AI colonoscopy uh, in, uh, in, in clinical practice. And uh, actually we've got uh, over 90% sensitivity in identifying adenomatous change, which is a decent result from this study. And uh, here I'd like to mention the availabilities of the end of brain sleeves, which is actually provided by Olympus Corporation. And the uh, end of brain is covering mainly Asian countries, including Japan, India, and other uh, countries. And uh, uh, as you can see, endbrain sleeves includes the both computer edit detection and characterization. 
And I'm very happy to announce that uh, we were invited to join AIG live demonstration in 2019 by Professor Reddy. And here uh, uh, we presented the uh, live demonstration of the use of AI during ongoing endoscopy. And furthermore, uh, uh, as we may know, Japan and uh, India has been had a really nice relationship or friendship for a so long time. And uh, in 1918, we have agreed to do a national level partnership uh, uh, between the two countries with regard to the AI renovation or innovation. And uh, uh, in this project, your appointment as an ambassador between the two countries to facilitate the AI implementation in endoscopy field. Uh, mainly, this project is conducted between the AIG Hospital and the Showa University, uh, but I hope uh, this project can facilitate the overall dissemination of the technology in India and Japan. Uh, here, I'd like to thank Professor Reddy for his uh, biggest contribution to this project. And also, I'd like to thank the Mohan for his uh, uh, really big support. So, uh, so uh, another uh, uh, a comparison which provides the AI as fuzzy film. And uh, this project product called uh, CAD-Eye also provides a nice interpretation of the uh, uh, polyp histology. But unfortunately, there is no prospective data to, to support the uh, technology. So we have to wait a couple of years. Uh, let me uh, introduce very quickly the further challenges. Uh, actually, the further challenge is focused on cancer recognition. Here, you can find a very tiny lesion whose size is around five millimeter. However, it was proved to be a cancer, not a, just a adenoma. Amazingly, uh, this embedded into some of the layer by 2000 micrometer. I guess it's very challenging to identify this lesion as a cancer and send this patient directly to surgery. I think it's a very, very difficult uh, diagnosis. However, with help, we may diagnose this lesion in the correct way. Uh, so th this is a video demonstrating how we identify this lesion as cancer during ongoing practice. And uh, we, we beg the help from the AI uh, uh, for interpretation of the histology. Uh, as you can see, uh, AI output the invasive cancer uh, for the histopathology of this tiny lesion. Uh, therefore, we can proceed to a, a correct uh, therapeutic way uh, a, uh, in handling this patient. I think this is the way to go, I think, in the future. So finally, I'd like to present the currently current challenges that I, we have. Uh, which are basically insurance reimbursement and uh, long-term effectiveness. Unfortunately, we don't have any data on these two, two topics. However, we don't have to be so pessimistic because uh, we've got a really nice news in the United States regarding the reimbursement for the use of AI. According to this news, uh, Medicare, uh, which is a public insurance body in the United States, is going to support the use of AI in terms of finance. So they are paying around 1,000 pounds, no, 1,000 euros, uh, uh, dollars for the use of AI for CT scanning, uh, which is uh, uh, targeted on the AI stroke de detection system. So it's a way for us to go if we've got a really nice cost effectiveness in cancer uh, prevention in colonoscopy field. Uh, but uh, it is also very challenging to colonoscopy because it's uh, very complicated. Uh, AI or computer edit detection system primarily increase the cost, unfortunately, because of the increased number of polyps increased number of the polypectomies, and maybe increased number of surveillance colonoscopies due to the increased number of polyps. However, this kind of increment of cost can be mitigated uh, by the uh, cancer prevention effect due to the increased ADR, and also uh, with use of CDX or computer-aided diagnosis. 
So the accurate cost effectiveness analysis is strongly required to get a reimbursement for the use of AI in colonoscopy. And also the, the biggest drawback that we have currently is the lack of data on the long-term effectiveness. We don't know the uh, effect of AI in the cancer screen population. We don't know the cancer prevention effect. We don't know the accurate cost effectiveness for the use of AI. However, we can overcome this issue. We are just launching a really big study in collaboration between Norway, Poland, and Japan. And this study is a really a big study with the long-term uh, follow-up uh, of the patients, more than 10,000. And uh, this study is going to be a, a really big milestone study to show the long-term effectiveness of the use of AI. So ladies and gentlemen, Professor Deer, uh, I'd like to summarize my presentation. Uh, I, I'm leaving two messages. First, I guess AI is being implemented into chronoscopy practice worldwide, including in India. But the lack of reimbursement and the lack of the long-term data uh, are delaying the dissemination. Therefore, these two issues should be addressed as soon as possible. Thank you very much for your kind attention. So I think, uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Vinay, for this uh, honor to, to, to do some commentary after this very exciting topic on AI and endoscopy. So maybe I can start off to, to really I think congrats, uh, Vinay and the IDLK. Um, why I say that is because I don't know whether you remember, it's barely about two years ago. Yes. Two yeah, one time much. Yes. So I think obviously, I think that was before the, the COVID time. Yeah, yes. I was uh, really happy to be able to grace your institution. And then God, I think this is about two years later. Yes. Exactly. Two years later, I think things, the world has changed a lot. So I think we can only do the Zoom this time, but nevertheless, uh, really congratulate you on the success of your institution. Okay, so I think, uh, uh, yeah, Yuji, you did a very nice talk, and uh, I do not have a lot more to say, except to maybe highlight one or two things. Okay, one is, I think, uh, just to kind of uh, re reiterate what you just mentioned, I think uh, certainly AI, I think, uh, will continue to grow mostly in the arena of cancers. I think uh, this is already shown, I think uh, in the editorial and of GI endoscopy and in 219. I think uh, then the, I think uh, this sort of interest, uh, bad reason, why are we so interested now in AI? I think uh, this is about two years. I sort of went through your, your all the papers you cited I think there are really new papers, I think 2019 up to recently. So I think the explosion uh, say, certainly says something. I believe, I think uh, this issue already uh, was uh, touched upon by Navresh just now. I think um, whatever it is, uh, we, we do recognize that a lot of what we do in our daily practice with regards to detection and diagnosis, um, I think is very dependent on the experience and skills. And this is why I think the hope is that the CADE and CADX can actually provide a more objective and maybe even a real-time support to, to do our detection and uh, characterization. And this is why personally, I believe that the interest in AI uh, stems largely from, I think two main values to the patients. One is I think, uh, Briefly, we say it's consistently of care, okay? So while we know that, while well, in experts' hands, in experts' hands, there's no issue. I think they can use the magnification, endoscopy, and so forth. But many people are not experts. And that's where I believe that I think AI does, I think, provide some value in uh, offering a consistency in the care to our patients. And obviously, I think the more important social issue is equality of care. Okay, equality to me is important. Okay, I'll come to the cost later on. But let's just assume that I think uh, we have so many patients, okay, including in India. I think are we certain that I think uh, all the centers are providing the same care to the patients because there is uh, an issue. Okay, so I think tertiary centers, no issues. But I think uh, there are many people who may not have access to the tertiary centers. This is why 
I think the AI may provide opportunity to kind of at least standardize the care in some aspects. So this is something that I think uh, will help to actually bring forth, I think, the value of AI to the general population. But I think the, the, the issue is, again, is um, I think uh, touched upon by uh, UG just now, it's about adoption, it's about impact, it's about the skill and so forth, okay? So I think uh, somebody did uh, mention that you can all have all the invention you want, but you can't actually implement this as skill, you will not have the impact we anticipate. And this is why I think the next important issue, which was already mentioned by UG, in terms of cost, in terms of regulation, is how do we actually uh, uh, sort of, uh, um, I think, uh, uh, enhance the clinical adoption or wide adoption of this technology. This, I believe, is uh, something that we have to think about in the next uh, few years. I think many more studies will come, come out, but ultimately it's uh, whether we actually are ready to use it. So that's where I believe that there are two main uh, uh, sort of clinical hurdles which we need to overcome. One is to identify, I think, uh, more clinical applications for CAD, CADE and CADX, which actually force adoption. I think we went through, I think we never remember sort of vividly, we went through with EOS. I think in the early days, people were saying that, oh, well, take it or leave it. But I think when uh, FNA came about, they were forced to use it. And then when treatment came about, there's no doubt EOS came, okay? It forced itself. So I think uh, sometimes we do need to actually uh, look for clinical adoption, which actually forced adoption. So I think uh, UG mentioned a bit about this on cancer invasion. This is something which is important because sometimes we don't have the information real time. So we need something along kind of the, the, the AI uh, tool. And secondly, I think more importantly, I think uh, we have to prove clinical values, okay? So I think already uh, uh, UG mentioned a lot about, I think uh, there's better care now, okay? Because we managed to demonstrate in many uh, randomized control study that CADE uh, can actually improve ADR, okay? I think people are very confident with this uh, detection now. But I think more importantly, now we need to actually have the other two values, which are important in the healthcare, which is cheaper care and faster care. So that's where I think I hope in the next uh, few years, many more people can actually come up and then uh, do studies to actually prove that CADX can actually save costs in terms of cost effectiveness and also maybe provide real-time decision-making, which is what I think uh, the, um, I think uh, we are talking about all these uh, strategies which are enabled, which are now being done using the, I think the, the uh, novel imaging technology, but maybe AI can provide a better objective tool to enable all these strategies. So with that, again, I think, uh, thank you very much.